I'm going to leave this note up here because this morning when I came up here, I go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do this every week. If you have one of those miniature computers in your pocket or in your purse uh, or in, that happens to have a phone on it, um, I'd like to uh, ask you to turn it off as we enter God's Word and think about the things of God's Spirit. For years, my sister and I, uh, extended family, have tried to get my dad a, a laptop or we started out um, I have a nephew that a, he actually teaches next to Penn State University, he teach computer skills. He brought a free computer and everything to try to get my dad to use a computer. And he was a very successful businessman, but um, didn't see a use towards the end for a computer. We finally got him a cell phone when, because he lives out in the middle of nowhere. And um, we finally got that all hooked up. And at one point, um, he says, I don't understand this thing. And I said, well, Dad, we pulled one over your eyes. I said, what you have in your hand right now as you're talking to me is a computer that has a phone app on it. I knew it! <laughs> so we're, he's learning as we go. But um, some of us, um, and, I, and I will include myself, there have been times when Especially, where did my phone go? Um, you would have think that somebody took me off oxygen in the emergency room, right? So this is a time, um, this is a time to just focus. Um, now, if there's a genuine emergency, that's a different thing, but um, let's face it. 9.999 things that come our way are not genuine emergencies. So what does it mean, um, first, belonging to the banquet? First of all, we're all invited. Remember last week, we are all invited. All of us. Even Isaiah, back, way back long before Jesus said, it will be for all people of the world. And we are all invited to belong to Jesus Christ too. So, we got to be we got to become perfect so that we can do that, right? No, <laughs> otherwise we're all sunk, right? We are made perfect by Jesus, even though we are not perfect, right? Don't ask me to pretend like I understand that. When the Father looks down and He sees us, He sees His perfect children, not because we're perfect, but because of what Christ has done on the cross and in the empty tomb, of course. Um, belonging to Jesus Christ. Luke 15, beginning with verse 1. I alluded to this, and I'll allude to it again later in this message. <clears throat> Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he, he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now, why does Luke say even eating with them? Well, because there were all kinds of food laws and cleanliness laws, and Jesus was notorious for not upholding those laws when he ate with the notorious sinners. Verse 3, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? He'll go get them. You're right. This sounds a reading of, no. <laughs> the gospel according to Lisa. <laughs> he will go get them. But that's not, you, you broke in on that, right? That's not what we would most commonly hear would he, he wrote that off on his ledger. Yeah, only one. I still got 99. That's not what Jesus said. If a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, he'll go get them. <laughs> what will he do? Won't, won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, 
he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. This ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. Where are you in this parable, in this story of Jesus? I know where I am. I'm that one. Yeah, right? We, if we're honest, even the best of us have lost sheep stories, right? Um, the vast majority of people in North America, by the way, about 19 out of 20 in the United States, um, and this study was done in the United States and Canada, claim to believe in God. Yet this belief seems to make very little difference in their lives and can we honestly say sometimes our lives? People believe that God exists, but they don't let their belief affect the way they look at the world. They make critical decisions or plan for the future. I'm praying for all of you because I know, I know this congregation well enough. Some of you have, under your breath, told me who you're voting for. Guess what? We're not all voting for the same person on Tuesday. Um, so we need to make, make critical decisions. Um, and some of us have different ideas about what's critical and what's not. And I'm praying for every one of you, no matter which way you vote. There's one thing that I'm certain of that nobody wants, whichever way you're voting, nobody wants to, to watch this nation uh, slowly self-destruct. Author Craig Goschow, um, I've used some of his work in Bible studies and book studies. I try to be clear on that. Book studies are a study of a Christian book, and we use the Bible in a book study, but it's not technically a Bible study. He writes, how many of you have read this? The Christian Atheist. The subtitle is Believing in God but Living as if He Doesn't Exist. Yeah? Yeah? For our faith to make a difference, the reality of God and the message of the Christian faith, including a God who pursues us at all cost, even the cost of his own life, must be heard as good news. When my mom died in, in my message uh, for her funeral, I, I lifted up Psalm 23 and I just stated to the, my family and the community that I grew up with that... Um, we're all used to the King James Version of Psalm 23 where he follows us all the days of our lives. But the Hebrew is a stronger word. He pursues us. He doesn't just follow us. He puts the pedal to the metal and he pursues us. He chases us down. Not to get us, but to rescue us. There's a difference, right? If you are a notorious sinner then you come to believe, and sometimes really good Christian people that go to church all the time will tell you that he's going he's gonna to get you. He's going to rescue you and me. And he already has through Christ. He already has through Christ. The good news of the Christian faith begins with the recognition that we are deeply loved by God. The same God who created the world as the Father, saved the world as Jesus Christ, and continues in this very moment sustaining and strengthening the world and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. He's not, yes, Jesus went to prepare a way, but what did he tell us in the Gospel of John? I'm, I'm leaving you my advocate uh, my paraclete, the one who walks us alongside of you, the one who lives inside of you, the one who lives inside of us and among us, and as we are surrounded by this Holy Spirit. Not only does God deeply love us, but He calls us to belong to His Son, Jesus Christ. And to belong to Jesus Christ is, is to completely open our lives up to the person God wants us to be. Having access to all that we can become in Jesus' name. 
The Apostle Paul reminds us that when we pray to God and tell him what we need, we will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. We need this today. We need this tomorrow. We need this on Tuesday. And we'll definitely need it through the week, especially if the votes don't all get tabulated by the strike of midnight on Tuesday night, right? We need that peace. There's enough anxiety and stress already. That's right. We have seen that tension, which we have not seen in our nation, quite frankly, at this level since the Civil War. And God forbid that we go in that direction. God hears that prayer that Paul writes for us, the one for peace, that guards our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. That God uses that prayer for peace to transform each of us to become the new person God desires us to be. We are still becoming, right? We haven't reached the end yet. The Apostle Paul reminds us that anyone, when we read this this morning in the call to worship, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. In the uh, NIV Bible that you have in the pew, it says, a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. It doesn't say the old life goes away altogether. It still follows us, right? Sometimes we rein it in and God says, stop it. I love you too much, Right? I love you too much. By the way, when somebody comes to us and just lays it out, our first response needs to be, God has already forgiven you. Now, how can we pray into the next step? Right? One of the most telling pictures of God's deep love for each of us is found in this morning's scripture reading. Jesus' story of the lost sheep. When we read this beautiful story, we begin to understand the extent of God's love for us and how far God will go to bring us back in the the fold because we have never stopped belonging to Jesus and his love. Think about that. We can go to the ends of the earth trying to get away from God. And this man, instead of writing off the one sheep, will pursue us. The images of a shepherd, it actually never says that it's a shepherd in the parable. And we even see Jesus, the good shepherd, at the end, right? How many images have we seen the good shepherd Jesus with the lamb over his shoulders? So we assume it's a shepherd. It might even be the owner that the shepherd cares for, but whoever it is, it represents God going through all kinds of danger. That's what's, it's not in the text, but it's implied. And it's only by God's grace that this little lamb made it this far. Think about our own lives. Some of you have some extremely powerful testimonies about how you've made it this far by God's grace. This is not a place where we point fingers. It's not a competition to see who's the most notorious sinner among us. (laughs) Let's just cut to the chase. We're all sinners, right? And sin is sin. There are laws of humanity that says, well, you're going to serve longer for this one than for that one. But sin is sin. We're all broken and in deep need for that one that's chasing us down. Not to get us, but to pick us up and rescue us. Richmond Church has been through some growing pains. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. This church in some ways is not the strong stalwart um, 
Dutch Reformed uh, heritage people that it once, once was, even a short time ago. I've witnessed that change um, in the churches that I grew up in. In fact, one week after I pastored a church that closed on a Janu Sunday, January 2, Sunday, January 9, the church I was baptized in as a baby closed the next week. My heart was just resting in that acid in my stomach for a while, just trying to grasp all of that. <clears throat> there, the only way we can avoid change as a church is um, when we start worship on Sunday morning, we lock the doors and say, if you're not like us, you can't come in, right? Churches have done that. And I've got to be honest with you, there, a lot of them are no longer churches, right? We're in a time of transition. God, though, is pursuing us. That pursuit has never changed. We are probably a little bit more honest now than we ever have been about our shortcomings and, our, and about our deep need for God's good grace, for God's quick pursuit of each of us. We are becoming a people that invite and include people that not too long ago were considered beyond hope. You see, God's teaching us that no one is beyond hope. Amen. He doesn't write off the one little lamb. That would have made sense to us. The, the story could have ended real quickly. But we're talking about God's love. So he does some very strange things. I'll leave the 99 and I'll pursue the one. And that one represents each and every one of us. Amen. People that were often considered beyond hope, people that were often turned away by the church in the past. Now all of us, those who have been here for a long time, those of us who are fairly new, we all get to experience the good news of God's kingdom. All of us. We may be able to understand a God who would forgive sinners and who come to Him for mercy and, and, and forgiveness. And we've done that. Many of us need to keep doing that. We need to keep doing it. I know I do. But a God who doesn't wait for us to come to Him, but instead goes to us and pursues us and then joyfully forgives us is a God who, ex who possesses an extraordinary kind of love, a love that we cannot capture. We cannot put it in a box. It's too wild. It's God's love. This is the kind of extraordinary love that God has, yes, for each and every one of us. I've even had some of you in the short time, Pastor John, I've done this. I'm quite convinced God doesn't love me anymore. My response is always the same. Are you kidding me? It's because you've done this that he already has loved you and he never let you go. You're letting yourself go, but he hasn't let you go. He's still pursuing you. He's still pursuing me. And this is the same kind of love that prompts Jesus to come to earth to search for both wandering and lost and people and then rescue them and rescue us. This is the kind of extraordinary love God has for each of us. If any of us feels far from God today, we do not need to despair. Boy, am I preaching to myself this morning. God is relentlessly and diligently pursuing each of us in His love. 
The Bible plainly teaches that all human beings have sinned. Paul reminds us a number of times. And I'm, I know part of the reason he wrote it down in letter form was so that he could look at it and say, that's me too, and I'm the greatest of sinners, he says. We have all at times lost the desire to serve God and that we have no ability to save ourselves. We need to get that sunk into our head, right? I don't have a little bit more ability to save myself than you do. You don't have a little bit more ability than me. No, we're all on the same plane there. We are completely broken and lost apart from Jesus Christ. Apart from the one who rescues us and picks us up. Jesus invites us to really live into our faith. I want to challenge you. Um, you can get by. You can go to church your whole life. You can get by by playing church, just showing up, um, pretending that it's like a country club membership, to show up once in a while and keep everybody happy. But quite frankly, um, I, I don't know that I have it in me to serve a church like that anymore. And I'm not putting down the churches that I've served before, but you can only put up with so much. Last week I shared what both Mark and Luke uh, made in an observation when they watched Jesus. Jesus taught and ate with the disreputable disreputable, notorious sinners. Those are really big words, right? Really bad people. <laughs> and tax collectors. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. That's a, in parentheses, so it's like a footnote. Jesus rounds out the story of the lost sheep with a teaching application for all of us this morning. He says that in verse 7, in the same way, here's the story, now, in the same way, from the lesson of the story, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And in another gospel, it says the angels in heaven are basically having a huge fiesta every time just one person says, Oh God, I am so sorry, Jesus, come back into my heart. I'm pretty sure it's a fiesta. Tortilla chips, the hot sauce, everything. When we all get to eternity, you can say, John, you were wrong, especially, you know, the angels are flying around and hot, with hot sauce or, or saying muy caliente, right? <clears throat> Think about that. They're having, they're having a party with Jesus. Mary and I, when I was in seminary, um, I got to work at Crossroad Chapel, um, a Spanish-speaking congregation in Holland. And I was really just learning the basics of Spanish. Um, then I got immersed in Dominican Republic, but um, I will never forget the praise song. By the way, that church was very interesting because it was on Latin time. The church service started like at 10 o'clock, I think it was, and then slowly um, I learned about Latin time. And some people said, well, we leave the house at 10 o'clock. Um, but everybody brought their hand instruments. And by the end of that half hour, um, we were just using all kinds of authentic, um, a lot of Mexican and Middle American instruments. And um, one of the songs was Fiesta con Jesus. And Mary used to, and I used to say, we're going to party with Jesus. Because yeah. <laughs> that's literally what it means. We're going to party with Jesus. And Jesus wants to party at every one, just one person, just one lost lamb. Let's throw a party. I don't know if the chips and the salsa are included. <clears throat> I know Colin wants there to be, right? That's some of your favorite food. Jesus invites each of us this morning 
to consider the response of that party, of a lovingly being pursued and rescued, even in the word repentance itself. I've spoken about this. I'll keep repeating it. The original word in the original language is metanoia. And metanoia is sometimes even used in English to describe something. But metanoia is not, oh, I'll just change this little thing about my life and keep going in a half right, half wrong direction. Metanoia is implied. It's a Greek word that means I'm going this way and I give my heart over to God in such a way that there is a 180 degree turn. And then we go this way. Now, this is what most of us experience. We allow God to work in our heart. We do the 180 degree turn and then we do this sometimes, don't we? God's grace is bigger than our temptation, right? And sometimes we go like this. I just want a little taste of that again. God says, no. Metanoia all over again, 180 degree turn. Now, we are here one for another to help each other, to encourage each other. Maybe someone has gone the whole way, gone back. We are here to put our arm around that person and say, let me help you and let's walk the way of Jesus, right? Let's let the one who is pursuing us catch us, not to get us, but to rescue us and to lift us up. Metanoia, repentance. When we repent, we no longer think of God as some distant deity, some cop in the sky who's out to write that ticket and get us and throw us into jail. I really struggled with one of, one of those children's Sunday school uh, songs that it felt like that. In fact, I remember saying, going home and saying, I don't like that song. God is bigger than a cop in the sky. And of course, I got challenged at home. You cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. Wherever you are. Gotcha. That's how I thought about it as a child. I made, am I wrong? I might have been wrong. I, it's just how I perceived it, right? The gotcha. When we give ourselves over to to God. When we give ourselves over to that pursuit and finally say, yes, pick me up, rescue me. Everything that I've tried is not working. Our behavior begins to change and we begin to experience genuine transformation. We begin to want what pleases God instead of what pleases ourselves. I'm going to say that again. So I'm preaching this to myself. We begin to want what pleases God and not ourselves. Amen. We come to love what is good, not what is bad. We experience a life directed towards others in Jesus' name, according to God's will. I'll say it again. I said it last week, and I confirmed it again this past Friday. If you're feeling down about yourself, um, just down about the way things are in this world, I'd encourage you to go volunteer at Matthew's house. Because God will take that down and he will make it into good to help a brother or sister or a community of people who are struggling. And he will give you what you need when you volunteer down there. Right? I don't even like saying down there. Do you realize, I, I, don't, I never clocked it in my car, but what is it, a mile? A little over a mile? between here and Matthew's house? Mile and a quarter. But boy, it's a different world, isn't it? What a different world it is in a mile and a quarter. Oh yeah. I, I can remember division in the 80s and 90s. I remember that as a young man. We need to be a part of the solution, folks. We need to join God in the pursuing of others. 
the confidence that there is no one beyond the hope and conviction of God loving on us deeply. Actually, we come from a tradition in this church with a deep, deep and rich catechism. And if you grew up in this tradition, you, you may have forgotten a lot of the other questions and answers, but you know this one, and I'm going to make it plural. Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. What is our comfort and strength in life and in death? that we are not our own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood and has set us free from all the power of the devil. Does that mean the power of the devil doesn't come and knock on our door once in a while? No, that's not what that means. But, and he also watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. So when I look in the mirror, I realize that this is what God has willed for my life. I can complain about it, but that's what God has willed for my life. In fact, all things must work together for our salvation. And because we belong to Jesus Christ, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, assures us of eternal life and makes us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So one thing that we can stop doing is every Sunday morning or in, every Wednesday night we come into this building and we gotta, I got to do this so God will save me. I got to do this so God will save me. No. God is not keeping score. God has already saved us. And our work here is to invite you to see that God is and has already saved us. I pray that that's true for all of us. I pray that I will see you in this life and in the next. Ultimately, God makes that choice. But let's stop trying to pretend like we got to do all this work. What we need to do is say, yes, Lord, when he finds us. Yes, Lord. And he finds us in the most dangerous, in the darkest of places. And we live in response, in gratitude. I was going to use the word thanksgiving, but a lot of times when I use the word thanksgiving, and people say, well, what does that holiday have to do with life in Christ? It has everything to do. Thanksgiving is not a day on the calendar. Yes, it is. There's a Thanksgiving day for the United States. There's a Thanksgiving day for Canada, right? And they're different. Am I right that Canada's Thanksgiving Day is like the first week in October? Something like that? I have other Canadian friends too that actually celebrate both of them. Can you imagine eating all that turkey and pumpkin pie two times? <laughs> yes? <laughs> it's a life of gratitude. In other words, say, saying thank you to God for what he's already done. Instead of, oh, I got to go do this so I can maintain my status of salvation. No. Ours is a response from what's already happened through Jesus Christ. We begin to live in what the Apostle Paul challenges the Colossian Christians when he writes, whatever you do or say, do as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to the Father. It's a life of thanksgiving. I love how Eugene P Peterson masterfully paraphrases this verse. I will tell you the verses in my head that make it think that buying that paraphrase is worth it. He writes this, Let every detail of your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. As Christ followers who belong to Jesus Christ, we learn to grow each day of our lives, not just on Sunday mornings, not just on Wednesday nights. We can say thanks in the way we, that we treat our family, perform our daily work, how we vote, how we participate in community affairs, how we interact with our neighbors, how we spend our money, and so many more things. We can say thanks to God through all our efforts to genuinely, generously share His unfailing love and His faithfulness 
to advance his kingdom for the glory of his name. And we say thanks as we extend a hand up, inviting people into the journey of faith. By the way, that's one of the things I love about our connection with Matthew's house is it's not, if you, if you really study that ministry, it's not just, it's not a hand out, it's a hand up. You, we all have a choice. Do you want to be helped up? But the person receiving the help needs to make that choice, right? It's not just a hand out. Are there people that probably take advantage? Sure there are. There always will be. But those of you who have taken the hand that has helped you up and helped us all up, can teach us a lot about this parable because all of us are that lost sheep needing the hand up. The basic fact from God's word is that we who belong to Jesus Christ show our love to God by the way we relate to others. The apostle John reminds us, dear friends, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love each other. And let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. And we know that truth has a name, and its name is Jesus. <sighs> May God strengthen us today and every day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have invited each of us into the sweet depths of intimacy with you and your people. Walk with us individually and collectively as a community of faith and show us the riches of what it means to belong to you and to one another. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.